correctly this time. Ah, there we go. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I want to uh, thank everybody. I always feel really grateful for the people that come. This is a very small group tonight, and I want to remind you, you've heard me say this before, I always think of this when there are small groups that there was a snowstorm in Boston in the very early 70s, in the dawn of that decade, um, 1970, I believe, and Trump Rinpoche was teaching, and it was a terrible snowstorm, and only nine people showed up, and of the nine people, seven of them became lifelong students of his, and several of those became cornerstones of his communities. Actually, Chuck Leaf became one of the first presidents of Naropa University, and Eric Holm became Lodro Dorje, who was his first student and co-teacher on many occasions. And David Rome became his personal secretary and also the transcriber of his poetry. And um, these people, uh, as well as Judy Leaf, who is the wife of, um, you know, Chuck Leaf, and uh, Judy Leaf became one of his most senior teachers. And they were all cornerstones of the community that he created. And in fact, um, the, the community that I came into being kind of very crazy and very wound up and a very aggressive and angry person who um, was spending my life in sarcasm, cocaine, and caffeine pretty much in equal parts. Uh, regular nutrition, much less meditation or developing compassion were all very secondary thoughts for me. However, I was always very taken by the uh, idea or inspiration of Jack Kerouac and the Beat Poets and the Dharma Bums from which the name of this group somewhat derives, it's an homage. And um, the kind of creativity of leftist sort of political thinking and the brilliance of these people's minds. And Trump or Rinpoche came to America right at the end of the beat poet time and actually began to coalesce what was dispersing from their mandala around him and William Burroughs and most famously Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso all became students of his. Allen Ginsberg in particular became a very close student of Trump Rinpoche right through Allen's last days. And um, it was a really interesting and vibrant community. And when I heard about it, um, uh, Trump Rinpoche had already passed. In fact, he died the year I came in. So I never got to actually meet him. But I showed up at a small mountain community, then called Rocky Mountain Dharma Center, which is at 8,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains, um, west of Fort Collins, northwest of Boulder. And um, <clears throat> it was then a very, very small and rustic place. And most of the people lived in tents in the summer and in the winter would go down to a very small community of people that lived in these cabins. And the cabins were actually built by a hippie community uh, a decade earlier in the 70s. And the hippie community were students of an LSD guru from New Orleans that actually ended up on this land that Trump Rinpoche's students had bought for him. And he let them move in and become his students. And they were called the pygmies because they were all very short in stature. And the pygmies became seminal people in his community uh, from there on out and also built these incredible structures that people still to this day live in on the land. Not all of them have withstood the test of time. 
they're all ramshackle and strange and odd. They're almost all works of art. None of them are make any logical architectural sense, but they hold the weather out and they keep people safe and contained and they're creative and brilliant places to live all scattered across the 500 acres of this mountain reserve and uh, I moved in there and actually got what some people thought was the best room on the land it just happened to be empty and it fell to me um, and the, the windows looked out on the expanse of the land it was really amazing and tremendous. It was a wood stove that I had to do myself. And my family, who lived a couple of hours away, um, and who I came to see when I left New York City, um, still hyped up on coke and aggression and freaking out, but yet drawn to something in my heart that I that I thought was deeper and more important than what I was doing with myself. And I got there and my mother said, they, they told me this retroactively, that my sister cried when they dropped me off because it had just snowed three feet. I'm an actor. I'm kind of left in this cabin. And there weren't a whole lot of people walking around saying, hey, welcome, this is the way we do things. It's like they dumped off some wood and I was a little bit on my own. And uh, I did burn all the hair off my face at one point trying to light the fire. Not that first night, but when I got my hands on some gasoline, which is the wrong thing to start a fire with. And, uh, but, it was an amazing experience. And, and I think one of the mornings I woke up and opened the front door and there was a deer staring at me right in the door. Like It couldn't figure out why someone was in this cabin and why the door was open. And we just stared at each other. And I went, this is where I'm, if not meant to be, certainly happy to be. It was the first time in quite a while that I was really really happy to be somewhere and um i remember one evening after a snowfall in the full moon the full moon reflecting in the snow all around me this sort of shimmering goodness it was it was tremendous i had never seen anything like it and rarely have I seen anything like it since it's like literally this magical land where the snow was in all the trees and all of it was shimmering with the reflecting reflecting um moonlight and it was it was amazing and the moonlight at that altitude in those days was as bright as daylight in many places probably you know and the dark night the new moon was as dark as anything i had ever experienced and you just had the billions of stars exploded across the sky and you would wander around the land at night. And if you had to get from your house to the meditation hall, it was a good 10 minute to 15 minute walk on a good day, but easily a half an hour longer when you're trudging through the snow and the winters got really cold and it was amazing we would go what we called downtown which was the cabin where the kitchen and the communal dining was and they had a wood stove and people would sit around the wood stove drinking sake and telling stories and reading poetry of the beat poets and oh my goodness i was in heaven and you know, it, there would be this strange situation where it would be so cold outside that you wouldn't want to leave the fire. But the longer you stayed, the harder it was going to be to walk back <laughs> until you were so drunk, it maybe didn't matter. And uh, so, um, but of course, it always did because the cold just bites through anything. And we would, you know, get back to our homes and curl up in our beds with the wood stoves and wake up early in the morning and 
trudge back to the meditation hall. And as you were heading in the early morning sky with the stars still in the sky and a little bit of glimmer of the sunlight coming over the horizon, you would actually hear the calling gong, the gong, gong, and hear the sound of the conches calling people the 15 minute conch, the half an hour conch, and then the five minute conch, not in that order. And you would, as you got closer, the gong would get louder and you would actually stand in line, not quite awake, still freezing, waiting to go into the shrine room, which by then would have been warm and inviting with the fire crackling. And it was just this wonderful and tremendous way to wake up and eating porridge around the community and everybody mostly eating in silence until the workday began. And it was it was really wonderful. And Trump or Rinpoche had only just passed um, months before. And he, that heartbreak was still evident in the minds of everybody, the very culture, the environment itself. And those of us believed in those days that what became Shambhala Mountain Center, but the Rocky Mountain Dharma Center was a magical place and that the environment itself was the teacher and we felt was the mind of Trump Rinpoche in a way. You know, we could wander around at night in the pitch black, feeling the energies, what some people would say the spirit, what in the Tibetan culture they called the drala of the place and you would feel this but not be frightened, you would be excited and exhilarated because there was something really profoundly um, entertaining and brilliant about heading into your fear with the back of your net tingling into the darkness. And one day I knew something was right beside me. I just knew it. I just felt it. There was no sound, so I knew it wasn't human. And I just felt it very much in my heart. And I was very macho about my flashlight. I would not use it. Um, other people did. And it was always annoying to those of us that sort of kept to the culture of not using flashlights and finding our own way around. And I actually turned toward this thing that was so scary. And I knew it was alive. And I felt it. And my eyes adjusted just enough <laughs> to see an elk staring back at me. Like it was right next to me, you know, the entire time, but they are so silent and so delicate, despite the fact that the being must have been 1200 pounds. And it's just looking at me, I'm looking at it. And the same occurrence would happen with cows and Eventually, I got a dog, and the dog <laughs> would had a big butt, and I could follow that butt because it would gleam in the moonlight, and I could find my way home. My favorite memories, though, were sitting around the fire drinking sake with the old students who would start telling stories about Trump or Mbache and start to cry, and they would tell the stories of the first time when David Rome would drive him around to talks and he had this car where the back door was broken. So he had to like, um, I don't know, somehow slide over to get out of the car to let himself out of the car. And one day David Rome brought him to this place in Boulder, which would eventually become the first Karmazam or community center they had. And Trump Rinpoche refused to move. He just sat in the back of the car and David Rome went, he didn't know what to do. And then he went, oh, he got it. And he got out, went around and actually opened the door for him and let him out. And that changed everything. That was exactly the way Trump Rinpoche would teach his students. It would be more like, he would set an example and then they would follow suit. And at that point, that's when his attendance started 
developing around him where people actually opened doors for him. And as you may know, he was largely crippled and, uh, um, you know, very uh, handicapped in terms of his mobility and his movement. And yet he was fiercely independent and, and yet he uh, would kind of always challenge his attendants. Um, he would walk faster than they could walk or he would bound down stairs before they could grab him and support him. He would sometimes just fall back and let, let them grab him. Uh, he was always playing tricks on people and practical jokes on people and dressing up in wild costumes, usually military gear and showing up at restaurants to, to do this, you know, kind of theater piece, I guess, in front of people and no one knew who the heck he was, you know. He'd go to restaurants in Denver and Boulder or Boston or New York dressed as a general or a king or a prince and he would tell people he was the king of Bhutan because no one in those days knew what that meant. And uh, he just had this way of making everything around him awake, you know, and startling things into awake. And naturally, he upset the apple cart quite a bit and a lot of the time. And he would give those early talks, holding a Colt 45, smoking Marlboros, uh, wearing a Western, you know, cowboy shirt and cowboy hat sometimes. And uh, he just loved the idea that our lives were a creative endeavor that we were a work of art. And that if we loved ourselves and had enough self-regard, we actually could come to some kind of creative fruition, connection, synchronicity in our life. And actually our entire life could become a work of art. So to him, mindfulness wasn't dragging yourself back to the present moment like as though the breath were a weight that you had to tie yourself to. The idea of being present in your life was a no brainer. It was absolutely the only option we had. And he has a famous, beautiful quote, which is actually on our Facebook page somewhere. So I'm gonna butcher it because I don't wanna take time looking it up. But it's when he said, look, look, this is your life. How can you not look at it? Look at your life. And he was actually encouraging his students to be part of their life. And he took this ragtag bunch of pygmies and hippies and abandoned runaways and actually turned them into smart, connected, and sane people. And the early days of looking at these hippies having run down to the Goodwill store to buy these <laughs> ridiculously ill-fitting suits so they could dress up because that was part of what he was demanding, that people dressed up for his talks and that they presented the best that they could be, very much like Sarah tonight, that we're feeling sick so we dress ourselves up and we do our hair because our personal drama our personal connection to that energy of the space is actually profound. And he really saw, he really saw the brilliance in that. I will finish with a quote from a talk he gave in Boston and New York. There were two sort of sibling talks. One was in Boston, one was called Creating Enlightened Society. The other was called Building Enlightened Society. I forget which was which, but in the Boston talk, he was talking about how instead of selling our souls to materialism and the the need to make money and survive was such a small-minded way to think when he was really trying to encourage his students to think like queens and kings to think of themselves with this grand sort of brilliance if you will, of being the top of the food chain. And they had this awesome 
responsibility, if you will, and opportunity to be part of the world, to be part of the world and to actually help the world. And he really thought that that was necessary and that we were selling ourselves short by, you know, locking ourselves into these fever dreams of trying to find success and stuff. And a woman asked him a question and she was quite embarrassed. She said she had a problem because she was addicted to shopping and she really loved shopping. And Tom Rouget <laughs> looked down at his suit and held his lapels out and he said, I just bought this suit. I rather like it. <laughs> and you could see the complete joy in his face and the beaming in his and you could see this woman melt. She just completely melted. It was like okay to buy things. Yeah. It was like okay to treat yourself fine. That wasn't the point. The point is don't be a slave to it. But you know, you could see in his beaming confidence that he was really proud of his suit. And I knew some of the attendants that were with him because I became an attendant to his son. And so that's a lineage and a training that we went through and lots of stories. And they said that it was really like a, quite an expensive suit that he bought at Louis of Boston. And he was so proud of it. And uh, but these were things that obviously some people would look at and say well that's an abuse of your power to spend money on a suit like that by the same token it brought him a kind of energy that he gave back tenfold to other people so he was very controversial and <laughs> he upset a few apple carts but by the same token a lot of us really felt like our hearts opened in a really big and profound way because of his teaching and because of the strength of his being. And today's talk had absolutely nothing to do with the Four Noble Truths. So I hope you'll be okay if we table that until Monday. But um, that's something that we can talk more about as we go. And uh, thank you for listening. I really feel uh, honored that I had the opportunity to share with you.